good morning uh, to all of you. Uh, welcome to this important uh, lecture series, uh, 75 lecture series being organized by ICAR, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, uh, to commemorate uh, the 75 years of independence of our great country. Uh, Ma'am, it's our great pleasure. Uh, Dr. Jacqueline uh, uh, U.S., uh, who is the uh, Director General of uh, ICRISAT, that uh, you have kindly agreed to deliver this important uh, lecture on future proofing the dry lands. Very important topic in today's context, in the context when we are talking for achieving the sustainable development goals, the context when we talk for uh, the, the food safety, uh, we talk for the nutrition security. It's a very important topic uh, which you have chosen. Uh, Ma'am, just I want to uh, brief you uh, that uh, our uh, Indian government is organizing, is conducting many activities uh, to commemorate our 75 years, which is going to be completed on the uh, 15th August next year, 2022. And today is the 30th lecture in this series. Uh, in the past, we had lectures of very eminent persons. Uh, it's not only on the agriculture field, agriculture research, uh, policy matters, but also on the motivational uh, aspects. So that we want to just give uh, so, so, some kind of uh, motivation uh, through yoga, through some uh, other meditation uh, re related things. And in the, in the technical side, we had lectures uh, by uh, Professor Ramesh Chan. We had professors by World Bank consultants, um, by many, uh, uh, many eminent scientists from US uh, and from other countries. And then we had lectures uh, by, uh, by the uh, Secretary uh, Department of Biotechnology and many more to come, uh, many more uh, heads of CG centers. They are going to deliver a lecture in the next uh, one month or so. And it's always attended by great personalities. Uh, you can have uh, a, a look, only a brief look on the participants. We have uh, do, uh, today uh, the chairman of this session. Uh, thank you, sir, Dr. Uh, R.S. Paroda. Dr. Raz Paroda, who you know, uh, he has been uh, he has been the uh, secretary of uh, Department of Agriculture Research and Education and uh, Director General ICR. So he will chair today's uh, this important session. Uh, we have uh, the deputy director generals, many vice chancellors. So keep uh, important persons are there, and others they are joining through uh, through other platform, uh, which is ICR seventy five lecture series dot webcon events dot com. Uh, through which uh, the, the students and the other uh, public, they just connect to this important uh, lecture. Uh, sir, uh, I need your permission to just briefly introduce uh, uh, Dr. Jacqueline Hughes. Uh, uh, she is currently the Director General of the uh, International Crop Research Institute for the semi-arid topics, a very important uh, CG center uh, at Hyderabad. A virologist by training, she has worked in the United Kingdom and Ghana before moving to the uh, International Institute of Tropical Agriculture in Nigeria, then moving to become the Deputy Director General for Research at the World Vegetable Center, World Bez, in uh, Taiwan, and later the Deputy Director General for Research at the IRI, International Rice Research Institute, uh, in the Philippines. She has an extensive publication records and strong interest in plant health, uh, epidemiology, gender equity, nutrition, and remote sensing and digital agriculture. Her work and that of the teams she has led has delivered significant impact across Africa and Asia, improving the livelihoods of some of the poorest communities. She has gained invaluable insight into the world of international agriculture research overseeing a diverse number of programs, encompassing numerous issues such as strategic innovation, sustainable impact, and cross-cutting research support. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. What a pleasure for us to have you, ma'am, among us and to listen to you on this important topic. And I, on behalf of Indian Council of Agriculture Research, uh, welcome you and uh, welcome uh, honorable uh, chairman of the session, Dr. Aris Paroda also for this. And in today's uh, audience, we also have uh, uh, Dr. Professor R.B. Singh, uh, who is going to deliver the next lecture. And you know, he's a well-known uh, personality 
We have uh, Dr. H. S. Gupta, who was the director of Indian Agriculture Research Institute. We have uh, uh, Dr. Gautam, P. L. Gautam. He was also deputy director general and then vice chancellor and many other key positions here. I'll, and many other uh, key persons I can see. Uh, I, I cannot uh, name all of them. And uh, we don't want to waste much time and just want to request you with the permission of the chair to please uh, take the floor and uh, deliver your lecture. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you once again. Thank you. Let me try the technology. Okay. Could somebody confirm that you can see it? Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Okay. Thank you. So, um, Dr. Mohapatra, Vice Chancellors, Dr. Paroda, good morning. And thank you, Dr. Agrawal, for the introduction. Other distinguished guests, participants, and let me say that all protocol observed. It's really an honor and a privilege to be invited to address you all. And this series of talks in my mind is so timely as it builds up to India's 75th Independence Day. And it's a good time to look back at the last 70 years and more and to plan for the future. So will the future be the same as yesterday? Emphatically, no. And why is that? Because we, all of us, are entrusted with envisioning and developing a better and different future. And all the technological innovations over mostly the last two decades have shown us that the right use of technology can change the trajectory of any sector, be it health, education, or agriculture, towards a better future without reliving the mistakes of the past. So today I want to talk about how we can together create a different future for dryland agriculture. The world has seen huge improvements in food production, availability, accessibility, and greater nutrition and food security all around the world. Between 2000 and 2018, the production of primary crops, so cereals, oil crops, sugar crops, fruit, veg, roots and tubers, increased by 50% to 9.2 billion tons. But four crops, wheat, rice, maize and sugarcane, account for half this production. Over the same period, the production of vegetable oils almost doubled and meat production increased by 47%. Production of kilocalories per capita per day increased from about 2,000 calorie, kilocalories in 61 to over 3,500 kilocalories in 2013. Those catastrophic famines where over a million deaths happen are a thing of the past. And over the last four decades, famine, mortality, was only 8% of historical le levels. But, or, and there are significant differences between the different regions that you saw on the map I showed right at the beginning. Global aggregate food production could solve all our hunger and nutritional problems. However, Endemic hunger and malnutrition persists across the poorer regions of the globe, particularly in the drylands. And the drylands are home to so many people, 2.1 billion, and a lesser known fact, produce half the world's grains and meats. The dryland agriculture in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa is constrained. Fragmented land holdings, resource poor farmers, low availability of water and other resources, lack of infrastructure, weak system, seed systems, weak value chains, and poorly resourced research into dryland crops. The levels of poverty, hunger, and malnutrition are much higher in the drylands compared to other regions, and crop yields and agricultural productivity are much lower. This is a bleak scenario. 
On the positive side, the drylands have immense potential precisely because they are starting from that low base. The opportunity for them through us to leapfrog over technology maturity steps to adopt the latest technology without making the mistakes is something that can happen. Both Africa and Asia have younger populations. Um, perhaps more comfortable with technology than some of the older, more traditional generations. And this can pay huge dividends. As agricultural intensification is less in the dry lands, there's been less impact on the ecology, on the environment, which is going to be a huge positive for sustainability and productivity. So I'm going to explore the major shifts that are taking place in our food systems and how we can leverage those for the long-term sustainability of dryland agriculture and meet, as Dr. Agarwal said, the Sustainable Development Goal targets. So big shifts in our food systems. Our current food systems are ecologically unsustainable, promote unhealthy diets, uh, waste large amount of produce, and impoverish the smallholders. Diversity on farm and on our plates has been reduced, but malnutrition is still crippling the potential of many millions of people to lead healthy and productive lives. Food systems globally are undergoing tectonic shifts, but the major drivers that I want to talk about are climate change, deterioration of the environment, changing global population profiles, and urbanization. So let's look at climate change and climatic events. Food systems are a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, and therefore climate change, as I'm sure you all know. And then crop production is affected by that climate change. We have a vicious circle. Crop production is the only way that we, humanity, are going to survive. So our food systems are contributing somewhere between 19 and 29% of the total global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Of that amount, agriculture is producing 80 to 86%, with the remainder coming from pre-production, fertilizer production, for example, or post-production, processing, manufacturing, refrigeration, and so on. We can mitigate climate change to some extent. We can encourage reforestation, change the way we grow rice from sort of use, instead of paddy fields, alternate wetting and drying. Moving from consuming ruminant products, not just meat, but ruminant products, which with rice production contributes about half the global methane and the judicious use of nitrogen-based fertilizer to minimize nitrous oxide production, which about 80% is from agriculture. Climate change is and will affect agricultural productivity, water availability and use, drainage and erosion. It will affect the shift to urban centers and adaptation by pests and diseases, weeds, or lack of adapt adaptation by pollinators and humans. So we can adapt our crops by improving photosynthetic ability. If we can move from C3 to C4 photosynthesis, we can improve water use efficiency by managing transpiration and canopy structure. And we can breed crops tolerant of temperature extremes, although flowering and grain fill may still be a problem. Sometimes I believe it's probably wiser to try and change the crops in a location than to try and force breed our current crops to meet those needs and adapt. If we could create the right consumer demand, that might be achieved. So from my experience, changing people's views and foods and culture can be more difficult than force breeding our crops. Climate change is going to bring huge challenges. Climatic events can destroy our crops. Um, they affect temperature, precipitation, wind, and 
we're getting an increase in the size of our dry lands. So the changing climate contributes to soil degradation, encourages the more easily managed industrial agriculture, monocultures, biodiversity loss, and the greater use of inputs to get more under increasingly difficult climatic conditions. So while we have enough food globally, and we can probably provide the nutrition globally at the moment, but the estimated impact of climate change on our crop production beyond 2050 would increase, the, sorry, will make the yield variation greater. Maize, sorghum in South Asia are likely to lose over 10% productivity. And in Africa, wheat, maize, sorghum, and millet might lose between 5 and 17% of productivity and consequently the ability to feed the world. Our environment is degrading and agriculture is critically dependent on healthy soils and adequate water. And our current agricultural practices seem to promote a loss of soil fertility and a shortage of water we are forcing the land to give us more. As we move towards industrial farming, which is more profitable, we deplete the topsoil, we create massive fertilizer and pesticide runoffs, which contaminate our potable water, and we reduce biodiversity. Our agriculture is using 70% of our fresh water. So, and you see it in the Punjab where the cereal producing areas, the rate of water withdrawal is greater than natural replenishment. Where we have greater incomes and urbanization, we have increased consumption of animal origin foods and the more packaged and easy to consume convenience food, both of which draw heavily on environmental resources and the larger environmental footprint. Increasing urbanization destroys farmland and forests, we know this, and the ecological services provided by forests is going to disappear forever. Industrial farming exacerbates this situation. Our populations are changing. Africa has a youth bulge. The number of young people is huge. Asia and Europe, aging populations. Normally we talk about the age of the farmers, but let me give you another perspective. The older and younger segments of our population have different food and nutrition requirements. And our food systems will need to cater to those. Our current one size fit all food, nutrition, got plenty of kilocalories, that's great. Not anymore. Our consumers are much more health conscious with greater awareness and demand diet to suit their needs and wishes and lifestyles, particularly so in urban areas. But if you look at reports like the Eat Lancet Commission report of 2019, which urged doubling consumption of vegetables and fruits and legumes and nuts and reducing by half consumption of sugars and red meat, these trends which many people have picked up on are driving fundamental changes in our food systems. We're going to be seeing perhaps more animal-based, sorry, plant-based proteins, animal-free cheeses moving from labs to the supermarket shelves. So supermarkets, the world population is going to reach probably just over 10 billion by 2050 and mostly in the least developed countries, and mostly in urban areas. By 2050, 70% of people are likely to live in urban areas. Urbanization plus a rise in incomes gives a change in lifestyle and consumption patterns, a change in dietary habits, and declining consumption of the raw components of our diets for more processed, semi-processed and ready to eat foods. It's higher in the urban areas. Um, in between 1990 and 2007, the supermarket sharing retail food 
increased to about 60% in South America and South Africa, and up to 50% in Mexico, Central America, and Southeast Asia. Aggregation and processing is going to become increasingly important so that the urban 70% have diets and food choices that they want. So the people in urban areas giving a loss of agricultural land, 2.4% of global croplands are going to be lost by 2030 due to urban expansion, 80% in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. This is going to be mostly quality arable land because that's the nicest land for building on. We're going to see less dry land loss, I think, and the dry lands could become our new food basket. But how? Our diets and food systems that deliver them are at an inflection point. We're at a time when we can deliver and encourage a change. We have supply side drivers, climate change, competition for water, energy, land, and interactions between food production systems and other ecosystem services, but also the demand side, the population, as I've been saying, our choices, urbanization and awareness. Although it's happening in urban areas, rural areas are not ignorant. They know what they should be eating, but they can't always have that choice. So we should be looking at disruptive technologies, leapfrogging mistakes of the past, looking at precision ag, artificial intelligence and blockchain, investment, crop breeding and biotechnology. The precision agriculture, which is basically the application of precise amounts of inputs, water, fertilizer, pesticides, at the appropriate time to increase productivity and maximize yields. But these, these precision agricultural practices can reduce the amount of nutrients and other inputs while boosting yields, can give the farmer a better return on investment by saving costs, but you need to use a whole bouquet of technologies if you're going to also reduce environmental impact by saving water and reducing pesticide runoffs, for example. So the bouquet of technologies I'm talking about are anything from self-steering tractors, drones, satellites, robots that you see in this image, the internet of things, smartphones, AI, machine learning, blockchain. You need to bring it all together into one toolbox. The World Economic Forum report of 2018 said, if 15 to 25% of farms adopt precision ag, Global crop yield could increase by max 15% by 2030, at the same time reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 10% and water use by 20%. This is the direction we need. I mentioned AI, artificial intelligence and blockchain. Predictive analytics are going to be a game changer. Farmers have access to data, they can collect, process, share more data and information faster with AI. They can improve or solve challenges using AI, analyzing market demand, not spot um, market prices, but analyze the demand, forecast prices, determine the optimal time for sowing and harvesting. AI can learn and gather soil health insights, give fertilizer recommendations, monitor weather, track the readiness of produce and be built into the apps that we currently have. Moving on to blockchain, it's immutable ledger technology can promote traceability, whether for seeds, organic produce, certifying produce origin or adherence to trade principles. Blockchain does strengthen our supply chains. It can build consumer trust and ensure more remunerative prices for farmers. I've used an example of that in a supermarket and I can see who the farmer is when the produce arrived and then say, ah, that's been on the shelf too long. I'm not going to buy it. A major application for example for India could be to optimize agricultural subsidies and crop insurance. 
because blockchain can reduce leakages of subsidies and insurance payouts, ensuring that eligible farmers get the appropriate amounts at the right time. Moving on to investment, agriculture sadly has been the last sector to benefit from recent technological innovations, which have revolutionized health, education, banking, and financial services. And the disparity is huge and stark. When we looked at the agricultural technology innovation investment, since uh, 2010, 14 billion dollars worth of investment went into ag, agriculture, in a thousand startups. And that seems on the surface to look good until you look at healthcare at 145 billion in 18,000 startups. But the good side is that venture capital investments and investors have seen the potential of agriculture. And in 2019, invested 2.8 billion into the space of tech for agriculture around the globe, which is four times what was invested in 2015. So modern breeding, and I'm breaking this into two parts. One is modern breeding conventional. Um, it's no longer an art. It's a carefully managed and implemented science. And one of the needs of the, our rapidly changing world is to reduce by more than half the time to move crops from our breeding facilities, our research stations on farmers' fields. Uh, at IGRISAT, we use rapid generation advancement, managing the environment to reduce the time to produce viable seeds of the next generation, single seed descent to fast track the breeding process, and marker assisted breeding so that. One, you don't need to wait for the plants to grow and produce grain, but on the other hand, you can test in a different environment for climatic resilience or resistance to pests and diseases. We can also develop biofortified varieties through conventional breeding using product profiles targeted at the consumer. So we can increase micronutrients, iron, zinc, vitamins, and so on. When we talk about biotechnology and crops, automatically most people think, ah, GM, gene editing, but we need to add those to the breeder's toolbox to get better crops to the farmer and consumer faster. And food developed through biotechnology to increase the nutrients or address a health concern are critical. So for example, we've had canola with greater amounts of nutritionally essential fatty acids, longer shelf life tomatoes, wheat without gluten, rice with vitamin A, kiwi fruit with higher respirator, um, lettuce with more iron. So we can do it. It's expensive, takes time, and the regulations are tough. Biotechnologists and stem cell researchers are moving from their traditional areas towards lab-grown meat, cell cultured seafood, animal free cheese, and so on. They've moved from labs to supermarket shelves already in Singapore, which is the first country to approve cell-based meat products for consumption and putting in the right regulations for the, to regulate cell-based meat, chicken, and I think beef. So it's a consumer and consumer demand thing but policymakers have to keep close track of all these technologies with policy frameworks ready ahead of time. It is so frustrating when you have a new technology, as I'm sure you, many of you know, that there just isn't the procedure to get it to the farmer or the consumer. So gene editing, GM, and the lab-grown meat and self-cultured seafood and so on, they are frontier technologies. They are a little bit challenging to traditional populations. We need to work on that. And we need to make sure that these technologies, which are challenging to the traditional segment of our population, can show their successes and opportunities for our future. 
So let me go to the dry lands. What about the dry lands? So we've described many challenges, many opportunities, but however, you know, those dry lands are difficult to manage, but they have a critical role. And our food systems are neither aligned in favor of the dry lands and the smallholders, nor for the nutritional needs of a large section of the population. A vision for dry land agriculture that can meet both human needs and planetary boundaries is to tra transform dry land agriculture in India, Asia, Africa, from subsistence level to a profitable enterprise. We need to make smallholder dry land farming fully, the farmers have to be fully integrated into the farm systems. They need access to inputs, markets, finance, insurance, storage, mechanization. So businesses, policy, aggregators, stakeholders should provide or in some way facilitate infrastructure, services, policies, and regulations. Women and youth should be provided access, a little bit patronizing perhaps, but facilitated access, because although legally they may be able to access, women and youth don't always know that they can access technologies, financing, and so on. So dry land agriculture must be sustainable. We have to work within the planetary boundaries, and business as usual is not going to work. We need collective efforts to transition to more sustainable agriculture in the drylands. Circular agriculture, where waste is a raw material, um, where you can use it to produce new valuable products, energy. And the aim there is to reduce resource consumption and discharges into the environment. Regenerative agriculture, including zero tillage, seeks to rehabilitate and enhance the whole ecosystem with a heavy premium on soil health, and water management, fertilizer. So closing those loops for dryland agriculture will mean less waste on and off farm, less use of energy intensive resources, less food being moved globally, locally. Um, we need ecological principles plus modern technologies. We need new partnerships and new economic models. We, we mustn't only focus on the easy, perceived easy win of better yields in the dry lands, but little pressure on the environment, which is incredibly fragile already. And it would mean a huge change in our mind mindsets. So efficiency, improving the efficiency of the dry lands, the value chains is really important. We lose so much or it's wasted due to inefficiencies. We have to make sure that these efficient value chains, little is lost, little goes to waste, has to be recycling. The value chains must be shorter so there are fewer intermediaries and touch points. Farmers must have access to input and information targeted to their agro-environmental conditions, which is absolutely critical in a high risk environment such as the dry lands. We can't put more risk burden on dry land smallholder farmers and their communities. Nonetheless, we have to make sure that it's a nutrition sensitive vision. It has to be quality, not just quantity of food. Many nutritious foods are priced out of the reach of the poor. Our value chains have to give greater margins, not to the consolidators and the processors and the retailers, but to the farmers and producers, particularly in the dry lands. The ready to eat convenience foods that you saw in that supermarket image aren't affordable for the poor. So our food systems have to be reoriented for our own health, but also for the health of those in the dry lands. Health and profit, please. Profit. When you think about the dry lands, and in the first half of what I said, you were probably imagining lush production, but the dry lands are often perceived as areas of the world's poor 
that they are ignorant, that they don't know about climate change or the consequences to the environment. They use outdated technologies. They produce crops that are not globally traded and low quality. So we need to transform dryland agriculture from its current subsistence level to a profitable enterprises. We need investments, we need policy and institutional responses to enhance information flow. Not business as usual. Let's get those existing technologies more available to the smallholder farmers. They can adapt, they can mitigate with us, but we need those policies to support them. And trade will play a critical role. It's already hampered by climate change. So let's use trade to support the dry land farmers. So just to wrap up, the crops that I'm talking about, the dry land cereals, the grain legumes, in the run-up to the UN Food System Summit were called forgotten food, orphan crops, underutilized crops. May I suggest nutritious, hardy, traditional crops? They're poised to expand in the coming decades as dry lands expand. And it's an opportunity to intervene to shape the future direction. With the right interventions, we may be able to avoid the negative impacts of climate change on the dry lands and break out of patterns that now look as though they're inevitable. Before we can chart that course, we need to know what that course is actually like. What are we going to do to be sustainable, inclusive, and so on? So farmers, women, men, youth must be equal partners in the dryland food systems to be inclusive. We need circular regenerative agriculture, understanding environment and climate, capacity development, south-south collaboration to be sustainable. We need to have information using the best of disruptive technologies to empower. We need to be nutrition sensitive. Sometimes we forget how nutritious the dry land crops are when they're not always so productive. And profitable. The farmers need profit. They need money for their communities. How can we help that with our current very uh, producer-focused value chains? It's our job, the job of national bodies such as ICAR, international research institutions such as ICRISAT, to envision a different future for our dry land food systems and to work together collaboratively to make it happen. We owe it to the smallholder farmers and ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline, for this excellent talk uh, and for very important messages which we have given by concluding that uh, dryland agriculture is really very important uh, because it is ultimately the quality and not the quantity which matters. Uh, and I think uh, the, the message uh, which we have given is at the current level of agriculture invest, uh, intensification uh, is less in the drylands. So the ecological damage caused by the agriculture is also correspondingly low and we can build on relatively undamaged agroecology. Excellent, beautiful talk, beautiful message. <laughs> A lot of uh, uh, carry home messages. Uh, I, I think all our eminent uh, uh, audience uh, they have got uh, from your lecture. Uh, now, sir, if you allow, uh, there are some two three questions uh, by the uh, audience. We can uh, put up uh, to Madam uh, before we ask uh, the chairman to uh, give his remarks. Uh, there are many questions, but we will not take uh, all the questions. Uh, some of the permanent questions are uh, how blockchain mechanism can be used for the payment of ecosystem services? It's a question by Dr. D.K. Sharma. I'm sure many of you know that answer better. But as we are able to, this immutable technology, once it's there, it's there. It doesn't change. How can you pay for it? You could put a premium on produce with the right provenance, for example. Um, I'm sure there are IT facilities for that. I mean, but keep in mind that blockchain, like 
Bitcoin should not develop to be so carbon demanding. So we need to keep the blockchain sensible, not you know going like Bitcoin does and taking over and contributing to the carbon footprint. Thank you. Uh, there, there is another question. Uh, how about greening of the drainage? So that means agroforestry system promotion in those areas um, by Dr. Mohan. Absolutely. Um, when I was talking about the environment, oh. you see, you can't see what's in my mind. I was picturing oh. a forestation as well as the crops because we have to keep in mind that when we harvest okay. the crops, we're left with bare land, albeit briefly in an ideal situation. So yes, agroforestry, but also, you know, as this, the environment improves in the dry lands, because sometimes it is so incredibly dry, but as we see, as you get in more water conservation, you get the crops growing, you get trees around communities, and the ecosystem services provided by the trees, you know, it, to me, it's a food system, not just a cropping system. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, give some example uh, of sustainable agriculture that is economically profitable adopted in a large area? Unfortunately, the examples that came to my mind regretfully were industrialized crops, high value, high input crops. And there is the problem for us. That's what comes to mind. Um, with the right support, for example, in West Africa, yes, the dry land cereals pick up, they do. But then the farmers say to us, where's the market? What's the need for quality? We have no market outside of our community. So there's very little requirement as a status quo to make a huge improvement. So you have to do all the business development and business skills and so on. In Telangana, I see the dry line crops picking up, yes. And I saw the vice chancellor of PJTSAU was on this call. And he would agree, yes, you can, but you have to spend a lot of effort because you, know, you don't want to start a vicious cycle where some investment is needed and then there's high risk to the crop and then there's a debt. If not a debt to the farmer, a debt to the research provider or DARE or whoever is trying to put the technology out, the government of Telangana in this case, it's risk for them as well to push a new technology out. So we need to be cognizant of that. Thank you, thank you. And then um, what is the extent of uh, increase in ever, uh, uh, evapotranspiration demand under future climate change scenario due to the higher uh, day and night temperature? Uh, what extent is uh, uh, it will impact dryland agriculture, which are already under water scare scenario. What are uh, the strategies, if you have any suggestions for this? So I'm sure there's physiologists there in, in this call, and you should be answering this question. But let me just say that although you might get a high day temperature in the Sahel, for example, the night temperature is dropping. So it depends where you are. If you're in the middle of a continent, you're going to get both extremes, generally speaking. You're going to have valleys that have different temperatures. Um, a lot of plants in the dry lands do wilt. So they're self-managing, they're evapotranspiration. But C4 plants perform better. They manage the water better. If you have a plant that's going to wilt, you have to make sure that the leaves do not drop, that they can recover at night to capture the early morning solar radiation. Um, the interesting part for me 
and I'm not a breeder, is if we can target areas that have a future, a perceived future climate, then we can breed in those areas to disperse the crops in the future when our breeding program takes five years, six years to get a variety out. Thank you, thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, harvesting data in India is challenging because of the multilingual nature. Uh, are we prepared to think of uh, blockchain technology that requires a highly curated and uh, uniform data? Any idea? Um, it's not only a problem in India. When I look at Africa as well, you have so many tribal, no, I'm using, I'm not using it in the Indian sense, but we have many different tribes with different languages. <coughs> there was a suggestion that you do all of these and the apps in French or English for Africa, uh, in English and I don't know, Hindi, in India, but then you're not going to address the needs of the poor. However, I think artificial intelligence can solve this problem. You need an AI learning and learning to do the translation in the disciplinary areas, which will then learn more. Thank you. Uh, and we take the last question because there are a lot of questions, but uh, possibly your time will not take much questions. Has genome sequencing done uh, in crops like pigeon pea, chickpea, and uh, other crops has helped in releasing um, uh, uh, improved crop varieties or anything uh, under the pipeline? So the full sequencing of full genomes linked to a gene bank, that to me is the best thing because you can identify sequences that have whatever trait you're looking for. And then in our current world where regulation, regulatory environment is not so easy, you can go into your gene bank, look at all the sequences, and pull out a line which you can then introgress. We're in the process of doing that. The genome sequences are quite recent, and it takes time to pull that information. I also put it to you that sometimes the biotechies amongst us publish in nature or wherever, and there it sits. So for me, for example, I'm trying to break all those silos so that that critical information can link up with another side. We are, have always tended to work in silos. I'm a plant pathologist, but I ended up getting interested in many different things to address a whole food system. Thank you, thank you, Jacqueline, for responding to those questions by our I main audience. I know there are many uh, more questions, but uh, we have to keep the time also, uh, so, uh, so so we are not able to take up all the questions. Now I request uh, Honorable Chairman, uh, Dr. Raz Paroda, uh, who uh, I told you he was earlier the Secretary of Bayer and uh, Director General ICR. And he had, um, uh, uh, he had many other key positions. And uh, still, he's contributing a lot uh, through uh, the tasks uh, which he's heading. And uh, through the various uh, conferences, uh, the, the brainstorming sessions, which he often organized. So uh, over to you, sir, uh, Dr. Parada, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal, for organizing this uh, series of talks by eminent people and I compliment Jackie for a very comprehensive presentation and for selecting most appropriate uh, topic uh, because uh, these days we are talking of uh, you know second generation problems of green revolution uh, or exploitation of resources uh, degradation of natural resources uh, factor productivity decline and uh, what not, you know. In that context, uh, one of the important uh, aspect, which uh, is also an effect of uh, what we call is a green revolution, that dry land areas were bypassed. And uh, selecting the topic of proofing the dry lands, which often I call 
making gray areas green is our important challenge currently. And you very clearly indicated that, uh, you know, uh, these areas do contribute. They have their own problems. People are relatively more poor and have less resources. But I also feel that they have, they are blessed with uh, many, uh, you know, resources like agrobiodiversity, good plants, good uh, animals, good grasses, and the trees. And uh, there is opportunity. Uh, also crops, which are more tolerant. And what now we want is, and you yourself have indicated that we need to go in for resilience and uh, uh, drought proofing can be by addressing climate change uh, through adaptation and mitigation. Uh, obviously, both would require for mitigation, we will have to manage uh, growing of uh, crops. Fortunately, drylands don't grow more of rice, but we do have cattle. So managing cattle becomes an important uh, challenge. Uh, going in for silvipastoral approach and agroforestry for climate change, if we have to go for sequestering the carbon, uh, then there are two aspects. One is conservation agriculture. I thought you would also highlight of that because what is needed now, but you did talk about regenerative agriculture, which indirectly also covers conservation agriculture for sustainable intensification. So in that respect, I feel that uh, there are challenges. Uh, dryland areas are affected more by the uh, climate change. Uh, you, you highlighted that. Uh, probably we'll have to quantify and see uh, where adaptation will be more helpful. And uh, I do see that uh, COVID uh, uh, 19 pandemic has brought up front the importance of local food systems. And uh, drylands do offer a lot of opportunities. And you did mention that our dependence of food is mainly on few crops now, which I think uh, is also uh, an, an after effect of green revolution. Uh, we will have to change it as well. And uh, thanks to UN now going to have a conference on uh, uh, sustainable food systems. And uh, emphasis is now being again given on, you know, minor millets, uh, core cereals, underutilized crops, legumes, and uh, legumes do play a very important role uh, in the drylands as well. And fortunately, ICRISAT is dealing with most of these crops, uh, including even the, uh, what I call is uh, minor millets, though they are important in many ways, uh, nutritionally, uh, now biofortified crops are reflecting that they are very useful. So we will need to do more. And what is required is more research effort, more investment in research. And besides that, uh, our strategy has to be very clearly focused on niche areas. Like if it is sorghum, then uh, Rabi sorghum in Maharashtra becomes a high priority. And not much research is there, not much has been achieved and no more hybrids are available yet. Similarly, in case of Bajra or pearl millet, uh, Rajasthan, has almost 3 million hectare in A1 zone, which we call uh, very uh, uh, less uh, uh, rainfall area uh, below 300 millimeter. And uh, pearl millet is an important crop. And that's where the challenge is to come up to replace uh, even a hybrid which we released in uh, mid 90s, HHB 67 where ICRISAT has come with some new uh, versions of it through marker assisted selection. But we need to replace it. We need to come out with something still important. And it looks to me that private sector 
is not putting much effort in that regard. So who will do that? And thereby, that's where I see niche for ICRISAC and for the national system to come together. I see many vice chancellors participating in this meeting. I wish uh, Dr. Agarwal, there was more you know, publicity to such lectures. 142 is not very encouraging number as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yet I see very important people are there participating, including Professor R.B. Singh and uh, many vice chancellors whose name is there in the list of participants. So uh, you have come finally, uh, I won't like to take long uh, because we have to finish by 11.30, as I understand from Dr. Agarwal, and there are two, three minutes left. But uh, one very important point which you highlighted was, and I always believe that uh, our future is bright because these drylands would have much younger population compared to the rest of the world. Africa and South Asia has the largest young generation. And our average age of the nation in India is 30 years. And uh, there are almost 400 million youth, uh, both urban and rural, uh, almost 200 in rural areas in India alone. And uh, they, they are the hope for the future. And what we need is, you said, and you highlighted in your last part of the presentation, vision for dialects. That's five point agenda. Uh, inclusiveness, sustainability, efficiency, uh, nutrition sensitive and profitability. I think these are all very uh, relevant and they would require different extension mechanism. They would require timely input supply in the dryland areas. They would require new technologies. Technologies, both, I mean, uh, through genetic enhancement, as well as through the natural resource management. And uh, that's where I feel uh, sky is the limit. And uh, we need to work uh, globally, 200 million hectare area is covered under conservation agriculture. In India, and that is mostly in drylands and around, you know, cereal and legume rotation. The most sustainable systems in drylands are cereal legume rotation. An example is of uh, maize and soya beans, whether it is, you know, uh, Brazil, Argentina, or, or US. And uh, we also have to think uh, very effectively now in going in for more sustainable systems for scaling conservation agriculture, for uh, having trained youth for private extension, for not only advisory services, but also for providing timely inputs to the farmers and uh, becoming an entrepreneur for value addition to link the farmers to market, which is not the farmer's uh, baby. It is not their task, you know, they just cannot link themselves to farmers unless value addition comes in. So all these, what you have indicated are uh, uh, the areas which I feel are going to give us green revolution in drylands, not for only food, but for nutrition security and sustainability. And for that, if we see at the cradles of Green Revolution, the partnership had been very important, which Dr. Borlaug used to tell, and which we realized. If we didn't have those dwarf wheats and rice varieties, probably Green Revolution would have not happened. Luckily, Ikrisat is based in India. We have very uh, good uh, partnership between ICR and Decreaser. Maybe it needs to be uh, revitalized. And now that you are not within one CG, you have all the freedom to expand your you know, mandate for uh, addressing these concerns. Why not take care of soya bean? Why not take care of minor millets? Why not take care of legumes 
uh, underutilized legumes like moat, uh, no one is working on them. And these are the opportunities. Uh, if we join hands, I see we have a win-win opportunity. And uh, I would only like to say that uh, let the partnership between ECRISAC and national system and our universities from the dryland area, many of these vice chancellors would like to be partner. And uh, you don't need support in terms of cash. The kind support is very important. This partnership support in kind can make all the difference. It is, and, and that's what I think we need a new vision. New vision for partnership, for making the drylands uh, more foolproof or making drylands as gray to green. I think with this, I would like to conclude and say it had been very useful presentation. Uh, thank you for sparing your time. Uh, you are a new DG with new challenges. Uh, we are all with you. Uh, and, and we understand if we don't uh, support ECRISAT now, then we are not going to make these gray areas green. With this, uh, probably, I hope Dr. R.B. Singh agrees to what I have said. I am seeing his nodding. Uh, I wish he had also spoken, but uh, time is the limit. So uh, appreciate that and uh, uh, would like to say uh, I am very pleased. Though it was last minute uh, uh, request from uh, uh, Rakesh, which I could not refuse, uh, being an old colleague from NBPGR time and uh, doing so well now in education division. So uh, Rakesh, uh, congratulations to you for instituting this very useful uh, lecture series. We are looking forward to Professor R.B. Singh lecture. Please do announce it in advance and announce to all institutions and universities. And I think we should take advantage of these. I would say this is another opportunity provided by COVID-19. We are more effective, more efficient, more resource saving, and uh, more uh, knowledge disseminating to through these kinds of webinars, uh, which possibly was not there before. We had to organize and spend and manage and plan for long, uh, and then spend so much of resources visiting from place to place. So this is a great opportunity. I hope uh, there will be a good uh, list of a few speakers in future, and uh, we will continue gaining uh, from this. And, Hope, Rakesh, you will also uh, bring out with some kind of volume uh, with the best important messages emerging of these lectures uh, so that uh, they are beneficial to those who are not attending. So Jackie, thank you. Uh, Rakesh, thank you. And to all the colleagues participating and attending this conference, uh, I would like to thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I, I'm just trying to uh, unmute uh, Professor R.B. Singh also for his uh, comments. Yeah. So, uh, let, let us listen to Professor R.B. Singh also. So just hold on, sir, please. Good. Uh, the, the, the... Yes, he is course. Now you can yeah. unmute, sir. No, not yet. Then no, no, he can unmute now. You please. have to unmute, Dr. Yeah, okay. Oh, thank you. I'm I'm caught unaware. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I would like to just uh, thank uh, Jacqueline for her excellent presentation and the various insights she was able to really make uh, sustainability, profitability, uh, all those uh, uh, you know aspects. Uh, I would only feel that uh, all this thing could be again tied up together. In a th with the three I approach, uh, innovation, uh, particularly demand-based, demand-driven innovation, the demands in dryland areas, particularly where the poor have the higher concentration, also the instability is so high, 
and the diversification and densification, when we talk about it, it has to be niche based demand driven in dry land areas, much more differentiated approach is needed in evaluating the resources and the possible outcomes. This is, this is again very important and could be helped in a big way by the analytics, the data analytics. The big data analytics would be able to provide us the interaction effect as well as the direct effects much more effectively than the, what we have been doing. So I will feel that the artificial intelligence, the digitalization and big data analytics should be able to provide us the differentiated approach to have the niche based uh, greening of the gray, area, gray areas uh, will be much more precise. So greater precision, and that word which was really brought out very clearly, greater precision through all these new tools will be extremely helpful. Mind you, if equity has any reason, if inclusiveness has to play a very important role, the people in the dry land area will have to be given the highest importance. Thank because you. India, it is not only the growth per se, it is not the multiplication of additional food and uh, the milk and so on and so forth, but it is that enigmatic situation of India. We have plenty and excess and export but we have the largest number of hungry and poor. Where are those hungry and poor? Let them be located. And I know there are higher concentration in the areas which are deprived of the natural resources, particularly water and so on and so forth. And therefore the dry land area, rain fed areas occupy a very high priority in enhancing inclusiveness of the country, in the, in the country. And therefore this, this, is, this is what I thought is a very strong message which came out in various ways by Jacqueline and we congratulate her and Equisat and as Dr. Paroza mentioned, uh, building a new partnership with these new uh, priority items and approaches so that uh, one plus one is 11 all the time and uh, with the freedom given to the CGIR system also for really looking uh, for the ways of establishing priorities and so on. So the priority setting mechanism of the CGIR changed and in and the government and individual governmental priority setting mechanisms in the new context have also changed, giving the ecosystem approach much more, agri food system, a system approach, multidisciplinary approach. If, if, if these are the new ways of doing business, then the partnership partnership, the vision for new partnership will take us much more faster and much more quicker. So I repeat the words of Dr. Paroza with these little modified words, but then I think we are on the same wavelength and probably with the Chrisat support and India's both working together, we can make the gray areas green for the green economy for all times to come. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Prada Saab, uh, for uh, nicely summarizing. Dr. R.B. Singh Saab, for your critical views. And uh, Jacqueline, uh, I am from the bottom of my heart. I am really thankful to you for giving such a such a wonderful talk, uh, which has given a lot of uh, new dimensions uh, to uh, to the persons who are at the policy level who are doing the hardcore research. Really, it's uh, it's a it's a great uh, insight into all those uh, gray areas, which uh, j just now Dr. Parada also has just uh, uh, repeated. So uh, please stay connected. Uh, Dr. Parada, sir, just I want to inform you, uh, we are going to bring out a document of this 75 important lecture series. Yes. And uh, we have two different platforms. Only key persons we allow to use this uh, Zoom platform. For others, we have the as I told in the beginning the ICR 75 lecture series .webcon events .com, where 10,000 persons they can connect. So many persons they keep connecting there. And then we live stream all these lectures. And then on ICR website, we have uh, the, the repository of all these lectures. Anybody can connect to these lectures. And uh, I have seen that even after these lectures are over, more than 5,000, 6,000 uh, 6, persons, they, they connect and then they just see uh, these uh, lectures. So it's a very good uh, platform. Uh, the next lecture is by none other than Professor R.B. Singh on 12th October at 11 a.m. 
Uh, I'll just uh, circulate uh, this uh, details, the links, and other things. So thank you once again uh, to each one of you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you very much.